Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. It's great to see everybody here tonight, and we want to welcome you all to tonight's forum entitled Financial Crisis Deja Vu. Uh, tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Institute of Politics fellow Diane Casey Landry. Diane is a banking expert, uh, has spent her entire career in the banking industry, most recently as the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the American Bankers Association. She's gonna to lead tonight's discussion with our panel of experts and uh, hope you enjoy the show. Diane. Thank you, Trey. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, to get us started, I'm going to introduce the whole panel and then they're going to each give us a, a very brief overview of what they think is going on in terms of finance. We've already started our discussion in the green room, so these guys are primed and ready to go. But let me just introduce the panel of experts that we have tonight. Um, John Dugan is to my left, and John's one of the top banking experts in the country. Um, from 2005 to 2010, he was served as controller of the currency under Presidents Bush and Obama. Um, just so you know, OCC is responsible for overseeing the nation's largest banks, and uh, he played a key role during the financial crisis that we've just gone through, and I think he understands financial crisis and systemic risk um, probably best of anyone I, I know. Uh, he's a Michigan undergrad, and he's also a graduate of Harvard um, Law School. David Muir was also doing a forum this evening, his own uh, study group, and he is um, served from 2010 to 20, uh, t from 2007 to 2010 as Prime Minister Gordon Brown's Director of Political Strategy. He is uh, a visiting fellow um, at the Institute of Politics. Um, he served as the Prime Minister's principal political advisor throughout the 2008 political financial crisis that was occurring, and he, um, he is also one of the world's top branding experts. We have to see the relationship between branding and, and financial crises. Um, he is continuing to advise clients throughout the world on the economic crisis and what's happening in Europe. Barbara Rehm um, is the editor-at-large at an American banker, uh, the foremost newspaper for the banking industry. Uh, she started with the paper in 1987, and by 1995, um, she became the Washington bureau chief. Uh, she became the paper's first female editor in 2008, perfect timing for the crisis. And she served in that role until uh, 2010. She is now an editor at large, and she is continuing writing a column on issues. She's decided it's time to have an opinion, not just report it. She's very good at that. And she also leads the paper's rankings of the most powerful women in banking. And to my far left, maybe that's appropriate. Um, Richard, we have Richard Parker. Are we doing branding here tonight? Yes, we are. Um, we have a lecturer in public policy and a senior fellow at the Shorenstein, Shorenstein Center. Uh, Richard Parker is a prolific writer. If you haven't uh, had a chance, I'd commend some of his books to you. The Myth of the Middle Class and an intellectual biography on John Kenneth Galbraith, his life, his politics, and his economics. Um, in the spring, he'll also be teaching a course, which I actually would like to take, but it wasn't here for us, um, on presidents, politics, and economic growth from World War II to Obama. He is currently, though, for this panel, is advising Greece on their response to the crisis. And if you've been following anything, Greece is sort of pivotal, pivotal in terms of what's happening in the world. Um, and most interesting, I found, is that he is co-founder of Mother Jones magazine. And for those young folks in the room, if you don't know what that is, you need to. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm going to turn to our panel, and we'll just kind of go from right to left. I didn't do this intentionally in terms of the seating. Um, and just have you all give a sort of a brief overview to the group about what you're thinking in terms of the financial crisis, deja vu, the title, are we there, is it over, redux, John, Okay. all yours. So since we're talking about the crisis that we're seeing potentially in Europe and comparing it to kind of the crisis that we went through, some people think it's the same thing. Um, but for me, it's, we went through something very serious in the United States, and we have a set of things we did, and pe different people have different views on how it worked, and I think one interesting question is, do those sorts of tools that were used in the United States crisis, or the, where it was centered in the United States, have any relevance to what's going on in Europe? And what do I mean by that? Um, so when we, there are a lot of reasons we had the financial crisis in the United States, but once we got there, 
uh, the government through many different types of programs and actions, both individually and across the board programmatically, took a very aggressive posture and tried to do many things to address the situation, some of which were very unpopular. Um, in fact, most of which was extremely unpopular and that unpopularity and unfairness that caused the unpopularity lingers to this day. But from my perspective, in terms of addressing the crisis and preventing it from becoming much more serious as a depression, it worked. And what are the things that I think worked? I think number one, um, they took that aggressive action in such a way that it stopped the panic. It helped restore confidence in the system. Secondly, they recapitalized, forced the banks to recapitalize and get stronger, get more capital into them so they, they would be in a position to lend coming out of the crisis. Third, they did not nationalize the banks. Um, and fourth, they did all of this by injecting money, but actually it came back out at a very low direct cost to the taxpayer. Many indirect costs, many problems. But it was a series of aggressive actions that made the problem better. We're not in a perfect situation now, that's for sure. But it could have been a lot worse, I think a lot of us think. The um, question is now, if you look to Europe, I'll certainly defer to my colleagues on it, they're facing something where they have a crisis of confidence potentially coming around the corner. And is it useful to think about taking some of those aggressive actions that we took in the financial crisis through strong government action, through recapitalizing the banks? It's different here because the problems are created by governments and not private markets in Europe. But the question is, do we need that set of concerted government actions to address this to restore confidence in the system. My own view is that we do need to do some menu of things like that, but I'll be interested to hear from my colleagues. Well, with that, David? Um, on, the, on the kind of exam question of whether it's deja vu, um, I would argue that it's not because the financial crisis actually never went away. And um, the, you know, I completely, I completely, um, completely agree in terms of uh, what President Bush showed kind of real leadership with a tarp. My boss, Gordon Brown, showed real leadership in terms of the forced recapitalization of the banks in, in the UK. I kind of slightly disagree. I think it was right to nationalize the banks because the management of those banks had to pay a consequence in order to make sure that you didn't have kind of moral hazard um, kind of going forward. But overall, they were big measures that calmed, that calmed the markets. Um, and that's what you need to do in a market panic. You need to go well above kind of market expectation and you need to have a big, big bang approach to it. However, a lot of the imbalances that caused um, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 never went away. You know, the, the big driver of this were basically global imbalances um, uh, between, you know, US and China, what that created in terms of an insatiable appetite for yield um, uh, amongst kind of financial investors. The fundamental drivers you know, of the crisis never went away. In addition to that, I would say um, that many European leaders, one of them actually said this to my boss um, at a meeting, viewed this as a crisis for Anglo-Saxon economies. They fundamentally misread what this crisis was about. They viewed it as just a kind of US and UK problem, when in actual fact, some of the biggest purchasers of collateralized debt obligations weren't US financial institutions, it was German, particularly German financial institutions. And they never had a recap, they never cleared the stuff off their, stuff off their books, and this is kind of coming back, coming back to haunt them. I think the other mistake that was made, and the reason why I think you know, this crisis never went away, which is too quickly, um, this, you know, this basically turned into an argument about kind of fiscal retrenchment. And we focused too much on the numerator and not enough on the denominator. And as a result, we've started to see, you know, so at the G20, you know, world leaders came together, unlike in 1933 in London, and they actually agreed to have a kind of coordinated um, fiscal expansion, monetary loosening, and key support for trade. So all the things that didn't happen in the London conference in 1933, which made sure that that recession turned into a depression, was kind of halted. 
but from having coordinated global action, we have now gone into a position where we have an uncoordinated fiscal contraction that's taken place um, in the US and in Europe at exactly the same time, and that is imperiling growth, not just in Europe, not just in the US, um, you know, but also in China, in, in China as, a, as a result as well. And so that's why I don't think it's deja vu, because it never actually went away, because we never tackled the financial imbalances. We never changed the financial institution. You know, we still have basically global, global markets that are not effectively regulated. They're still regulated on a, na on a national basis. And the imbalances that caused this crisis have not gone away. And until ultimately you deal with those kind of three things, we are likely to live in the same movie again and again again, so more like Groundhog Day than anything else. Groundhog Day. <laughs> well, Groundhog Day is probably a good flip over to the, I'm not so sure we want to be in Groundhog Day, but Barb, what's your views on all this? You've been covering this for a long time. Um, I think it, it's interesting that for me, like 2008, it, the banks were a problem for the governments, and now it's the governments that are kind of a problem for the banks. Um, because if we recognize all the sovereign debt losses, there will be a huge hole in the bank's balance sheets and we'll have to go bail them out again. Uh, I agree the crisis isn't over, but it kind of depends on how you define the word crisis. I mean, 2008, that from like August to maybe February of 2009, there wasn't a day that we weren't just sitting around waiting for like the next thing you couldn't imagine to happen to happen. That's a little different now. You know, I think Europe is having this kind of slow burn um, where we had credit markets completely freeze companies fail, I mean, things had to be done. And, and as Doc, I won't repeat all the things that John said, I mean, we did a lot of stuff, our government did a lot of things to make the crisis come under control. Now, that didn't, I'm not gonna go down this road right now, but I mean, obviously we still have a huge house, housing problem in this country that wasn't solved in 2008. And that was, st that was a problem in 2008, and it's still a problem now. But we did do a lot of things that got us out of the crisis mode. And I think right now, Europe is in that same spot that we were in in the fall of 08. If they, you know, how many times have I watched, read a story in the FT in particular where, you know, some politician from the EU said, this, we really mean it this time. You know, concrete, substantive change will happen. At, you know, details to come. And then no one ever, there are no details. So now they've got their new deadline of what, October 23rd, and then there's the G20 meeting in France in early November. And I think if we get to that point and there's still no actual, you know, type, you know, I don't want to use the word TARP, but something like a TARP. You know, I really am worried about what's going to happen. I mean, that's going to be a real crisis, and it will affect us. Um, you know, there's not, the, the you know, global finance is so connected now. What happens there is going to affect us here. Um, I, I think that's kind of all I really wanted to say on that. I mean, I, I could no, talk fine, about a thousand fine. things, but I... No. And, and I would just say that, I know we don't like to say TARP, but I, I would make the argument that TARP did work. It well, just has a bad name. Right? No, I, I'll just, two minutes on TARP. It's, it was ugly. I mean, you guys gotta admit, it was, it was every day was a new what it was really gonna do. You know, I mean, it came out pretty darn good, but it really didn't, it's, it's, it's conception and it's execution in the, it, as it was going on, was really ugly. It, it evolved. Yeah, it, it did evolve. Somebody said the only accurate thing about TARP in its name was the T for troubled. Yeah. It was for troubled, so. <laughs> That's good. Um, with that, Richard, you've been, you know, following this crisis, and you've also been advising Greece, which is sort of center to the crisis in Europe. Let me start by uh, offering a little bit of autobiographical insight into the extreme left on the panel, which is my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was a banker a small town banker from 1902 until 1932. He lived in his early years through that first great crisis of 1905 when J.P. Morgan played the role of the central bank of the United States because we had no Federal Reserve. And by the late 1920s, he owned three small banks in eastern Iowa and made the mistake when the Depression started of not foreclosing his farmers and his businessmen because they were friends of his and he knew them and he'd invested in them because Bankers in small towns invest in people they trust. And the world of banking came to an end for him. Uh, my grandmother suffered a stroke and, and lived on for another 30 years paralyzed. And my mother had to drop out of college after a year of college because they couldn't afford to send her to college. She went to work as a secretary and uh, helped get my brother, my uncle, through 
college because that's what women did in the 1930s. They got the men through college and then hoped that the college-educated men would marry the women who couldn't afford to go to college. So for me, banking crises aren't abstractions. They're genetically encoded in me in terms of the human costs of massive banking or financial system failure. And I think it's very important when we talk at an institution like the Kennedy School never to let go of that stark human dimension. It isn't enough to say that a quarter of all uh, homeowners with mortgages find that their homes are underwater. You have to know somebody or be somebody who's living with that day to day, <coughs> wondering whether he or she will have the job the next week that will allow them to make the mortgage payments. Meanwhile, trying to work down the credit card debt or the uh, built up education debt that they're still trying to work down in a system that makes it uh, almost inevitable that living requires the acquisition of debt. Now, I also grew up in the period after the Second World War, and so I lived through a period in which there were no major American banking crises. If you look from the late 1930s up to the mid-1970s, there were no major banking failures. The first big banking failure in my, adult, in my lifetime was Franklin National in 1975, 74, and it failed not because it was performing its function as a traditional commercial bank, but because <clears throat> in the wake of blowing up Bretton Woods, Franklin had discovered the world of uh, 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 currency trading and had gotten itself on the wrong side of a large number of trades and had collapsed. It was a harbinger of what's been going on in the financial system in the United States and increasingly around the world ever since, that a process of steady deregulation in stages oftentimes meant as a response to immediate crises, but oftentimes meant to follow through on a, a logic of a certain style of economics, which is by no means the, uh, the entirety of economic thinking, but of a school of economics that tends to favor private firms and private profitability over collective goods and collective action, believing that collective goods derive from the sum of those private actions and that private freedom. So there are several levels at which I think we need to look at this crisis. It's not simply that we had a particular crisis as a consequence of particular institutional arrangements around uh, uh, both products in the market and also the way that the large firms were organized in the market in the first decade of the 20th, uh, 21st century. We need to understand how America got from the middle of the 20th century to today. We need to understand what the flaws in that model are, and later on I would be more than glad to discuss very specifically what some of those flaws are in my view, and I know that we'll have disagreement, but that's what these forums are for. And then finally, I think we have to have a very, very serious conversation about what it means to rebalance the relationship between private markets and government given that these, are, uh, these, market, these firms are functioning in an industry which the taxpayers of the United States and of other countries have agreed to backstop in a way that no other industry that I'm, or very few other industries that I'm aware of enjoy in the same way. This is a very specific kind of industry, the financial, the financial markets. And because of the enormous amount of backstopping by taxpayers and governments and the willingness of governments to intervene when these industries get themselves in trouble, in ways that government does not generally intervene when other industries begin to fail, makes them a special case, and we need to understand what's needed in this special case to make them work for the community as a whole. Thank you. Well, that's a wide range of views. Um, well, we think about what the reaction was in 2008, and John, you talked about the unprecedented actions that the U.S. government took, and you're saying in terms of a taxpayer um, backing it, but I mean, the government took these actions to prevent the U.S. from going down further into a financial crisis and to forestall a Great Depression from, from taking something from Ben Bernanke. I mean, do you think we took the right actions and are you think we on the right path? I mean, do you think that we put the taxpayers too much at risk? And I'll go to John and, you know, David and, and Barb, you guys can jump in if you... I, mean. I absolutely think we took the right steps. Um, and it could have come out a much different way. I think it was a progression of steps and I think they could have gone different directions, but they proved to be ones that instead of having a prolonged recession go into a depression, we got into a period of sluggish economic growth. 
and we, the panic abated, confidence was restored, and in the end, even though many resources were put at the disposal and put into as a backstop, as was indicated, the actual direct cost to the federal taxpayer has been extremely low, less than the SNL crisis from a long time ago. Um, and for the banking system as a whole, actually the government has made money on the TARP investments. Now that's not to say you don't have huge indirect costs, but the point is we're in a much better place because of those actions than we otherwise would have been, in my view. Anybody else have a view? I would just say that uh, you know, TARP is one part, Dodd-Frank is the second part, right. and, and I, I kind of agree with John on most of what you said about TARP. I think Dodd-Frank was a reaction to the crisis that you know, really, we could talk about that for the next three hours, so I'll just try and be as brief as possible, but it, it created a lot, it, it, it basically said, hey, you know what, the regulators did a lousy job of making sure the financial institutions, sorry, John, okay. um, uh, did a lousy job of making sure the financial institutions, you know, don't make lots of lousy loans and take too many risks and not have enough capital. And then Dr. Frank turned around and said, but you know what, we're going to entrust these same regulators to do a much better job next time. That, that wasn't a super great idea, I don't think. Um, and it created a lot of, and this is the part where I don't want to get too specific because I'm afraid I'll bore you, but the way it tried to, to, to prevent the next crisis is very convoluted, uh, requires, requires way more political cooperation than we ever get in our government, and I just am afraid that our, you know, the FSOC and the living wills and the resolution authority, all that stuff that I'd be happy to talk about more if we needed to, is just not going to work in when the next crisis hits. Since we threw out a term Dodd-Frank and we didn't define that first, let me just say um, the second response after we finished with TARP and the Congress went through and they, uh, they passed what was, became known as the Dodd-Frank Act or the Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010. Um, and so anyway, now uh, that was also a very domestic U.S.-based, U.S.-focused reform law. It had nothing to do globally or did it, David? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you look at the kind of response to the crisis, there's, there's initially... Um, there's initially kind of domestic response, so there's the kind of uh, UK response in kind of September, October, um, uh, TARP, you know, TARP, October, October, November, um, and that that basically created a, a fire stop. It, it dealt with kind of confidence. The the really important thing was then to kind of get agreement at a glo global level, and I don't think you can underestimate the role that that kind of played in kind of lifting up confidence and making sure that there was a kind of coordinated response on it. And I think the reason why we're still in the same movie is that we forgot the lessons of that. And you can have regulation like Dodd-Frank, Dodd the, you know, the UK is, is, is moving around the kind of deck chairs um, in terms of its regulatory response. They say a tri, the current government says a tripartite um, regulatory structure was incompetent and you need to give the Bank of England full responsibility, not just for monetary policy, but also for um, a regulation, despite the fact that that, that same um, regulatory structure failed when bearings did. You know, a lot of this at the end of the day is you can move around domestic regulatory structures, but these are global markets. And unless we kind of deal with this um, on a coordinated global basis, we are likely to see, you know, financial crises, and financial crises have accelerated since the 1970s. They are more common um, than ever before because we're fundamentally not dealing in a globally coordinated way with it. And secondly, the other thing I would say is banks have behaved and continue to behave in an irresponsible way, which is, if you look at the case of, of the UK, um, there's a, a very good guy called Andrew Haldane at the Bank of England. So he's hardly a kind of Occupy Wall Street chap. And... Um, he, he had a very interesting data point. He said if the banks had paid out a third less in dividend payments between 1997 and 2003, if they had paid their staff 10% less, and if they had not had payouts when, when they were in loss, they would have held back $75 billion, um, you know, in terms, in terms of reserves. And that would have stopped taxpayers being on the hook. And so, you know, it's very clear that we do need kind of global regulation, and that is very, very important in changing some kind of bank behavior as well. Yeah, Richard, what do you think about this? Well, I just wanted to come back to John's point about uh, not a lot of net effective cost, because it's, a, it's an Direct. idea. I'm sorry? Direct cost. Direct cost. Uh, 
this is a little bit like the story of the ambulance driver racing down the street drunk and hitting the person crossing the street, then picking the person up, driving the person to the hospital and announcing at the end of the quarter that the ambulance company was making money so that the direct costs of the accident were quite low. The person dies, and so the indirect costs to the person are relatively high. Uh, and we need, to, we need to draw something of an analogy here, not just in terms of the uh, trillions of dollars worth of decline in the value of U.S. housing or the loss of U.S. business output or the fact that the total of U.S. unemployment and underemployment is still north of 15 percent, uh, or more painfully around the world to recognize what the Food and Agricultural Organization recognized two years ago, that more than 150 million people around the world were pushed into a state of malnutrition by the slowdown of economies around the world caused by the collapse on Wall Street and in London City, and that UNICEF estimates that somewhere between 15 and 20 million children under the age of five died of preventable disease or malnutrition because of that same blowback from Wall Street's meltdown. So when we talk about direct and indirect costs, I, I think it's important to keep the indirect costs firmly in front of our eyes as we carry on the conversation. Yep. Go ahead, John. No, I, I wasn't going to respond. I was going to ahead, talk on the point. I actually think there is global coordination. It's not consistent, and there are places where it's not coordinated. But there are some places in which, in the wake of the crisis, there's actually quite a lot going on globally. And I, the, the place I would say that is, is raising capital requirements for banks. That's clearly being done on a global basis, very significantly, very different. The, it's, it makes your eyes glaze over talking about things in Basel III, but these are very significant changes that will make banks considerably safer on a go-forward basis. I mean, the way I like to talk about this is when we, leading up to the crisis, it was as if we had an interstate highway system where we let the speed limits go up to 120 miles an hour, and we had a lot of fatalities. And then we had the crisis, and the government responded, and everybody knew we had to lower those speed limits to something that was more manageable and reduce the number of fatalities. And they've been trying to bring them down to 60 miles an hour. The question now is, and it's an internal question, is if you go too far, you'll continue to reduce fatalities. But nobody thinks that we should have an interstate highway system with a 20 mile an hour speed limit. And so you can go too far in the name of safety and affect economic growth. And there is a trade-off that's very hard to balance correctly. It's a subject of lots of debate. But capital is one place where I think everybody agreed we need more and better. Other places, derivatives, other kinds of regulation, there has not been the kind of coordination that we need. Well, let me come back on, that, on the capital issue because while there is coordination in Basel as a town in Switzerland, and there's a, uh, the group of which, seven, which, how many countries are involved? The G20. The G20 are involved in terms of setting the capital standards. But there's been a lot of differences of how the, that has been implemented country by country. I mean, how the US chose to interpret the Basel standards and how the Europeans have chosen country by country, it's been very different. I mean, is, is it possible to get global coordination on capital where people actually interpret the terms so that they mean the same thing? It's possible, but it's difficult. Well, they haven't done it to date. We've been doing this since No, but it's more of an issue now, Diane, and I think it's been put into play more recently, and the global bodies are feeling much more pressure to make sure, frankly, that some people don't cheat. Now, everybody thinks the other person is cheating. This is the way this works. But they're actually setting up mechanisms to have people from different countries go examine to see if there's coordination. We'll see whether and how effective that will be, but that's much more much higher on the agenda getting even implementation than it once was. I think that's actually true. Um, I mean, there's certainly a, a lot more lip service, and I think there's some substance behind it to um, making sure that everybody implements it the same way. I mean, I think where you get to, again, I hate to get so specific, but I think where you get to some of the problems are these surcharges that they're tacking on top of it, and exactly how countries interpret that sort of thing you know, domestically. But I think We've come, I think some, you just mentioned 87. I mean, that's when we started this whole Basel capital, let's have an international rule that everybody can agree on. We've been doing that now a long time. Right, that's what I, that's what I and, meant. And I think we need to take that next step where we actually, I mean, there's really not that many global financial institutions, maybe 50. You know, couldn't we just have some kind of global coordinating body, maybe that FSB thing that they started after 
the Financial Stability Board. It, it was the new Financial Stability Forum. I mean, we have so many acronyms in this world, it's not funny. Um, but just some kind of global coordinating body that basically polices the top 50 companies in the world. I know that sounds kind of Pollyanna because it's so simple. But if we can regulate, if we can coordinate on capital, I think we ought to be able to coordinate on actual oversight where we send teams of examiners in from six different countries to J.P. Morgan Chase and we, we can all agree on whether or not they're reserving enough or ha holding enough capital, whether they're well managed, whether they're taking too many risks. I think that's a good idea. I mean, I mean, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, we've got to make sure that we design the right kind of safety belt. But we also have to have a look, you know, since we're using our driving metaphor, about the design of the car, not just the safety belt. And, you know, I go back to the kind of point that I said at the beginning, which is what caused this crisis? Which was, yeah, there's, you know, there's clearly, exam clearly examples of greed, but the major driver for it was an insatiable appetite for yield. And that, that resulted from the fact that there were major imbalances in the global economy. And ultimately, unless you kind of deal with that in a coordinated way, you can, you can forever look for the best type of safety belt, but you're going to still have a deeply unsafe car. And, you know, that's why, you know, there needs to be, you know, a much bigger and more profound discussion about some of the imbalances, you know, that, that exist. The Eurozone crisis is a crisis of imbalances. And everybody focuses in on the Greeks, but the, the, the Germans are also dri a major driver of the, the imbalance because their exports have been massively underpriced by the Euro. And so, you know, I kind of go back to this point, which is, you know, we do need to have more effective regulation and some of the stuff on Basel is, is the right type of step, but there's too much focus on the safety belt and there's not enough focus on the design of the car. As to comments, let me ask you a question. If there's been a global insatiable demand for capital, why have real interest rates been so historically low for so long? Interest rates are a, a measure yeah. of demand, and if demand is high, that presumes that interest rates will be high relatively. And the last 20 years compared to the previous 20 years has been a period of really remarkably low real interest rates globally. And the major, the, the, the major, dri major driver of that has been um, mm -hmm. you, the, the Chinese, scared by the Asian crisis in 1998, made sure that they never wanted to have to go to the IMF, which meant that they built up huge, uh, you know, huge dollar balances. They were major purchasers of, uh, of U.S. treasuries, which forced down uh, treasury, tr treasury yields. That's the benchmark by which people kind of price risk. And it was that kind of major imbalance between, the, between China and the U.S. that created this kind of insatiable appetite for U.S. Treasuries, which then created a real drive for yield inside financial institutions. And unless so that I, is kind so of So I think what that tells me as an economist is that interest rates by themselves operating in a stylized notion of a free market actually aren't good measures of what the real demands are. Because what's happening is that economies such as the Chinese, which only passively resemble uh, Marshallian economies uh, have such an enormous impact on the world. And if, if it is true that we live in a world in which there is an intricate interweaving of governments and corporate and market interests, and we have it as well in commodities, particularly oil being the best example, where now 80% of the world's known reserves are owned by states, not by companies, then the scope of both the problem and the need for the, uh, the strength of, uh, of diagnosis goes beyond what we're talking about so far, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that, that's, exa that's exactly my point, which is we can't just focus in on financial regulation. We have to focus in on some of the, the big imbalances that exist um, in, okay. in the world well, at the moment. Well, let's take back to what's going on right now in the Eurozone. And, you know, the, you suggested that the financial crisis um, was never really addressed and it's not over. In some ways, the US, John, I think you've suggested that we did address our crisis and there is this con contagion that's over in Europe that may bleed over. Um, so, I mean, there is a question, you know, where is Europe, where is the US, is the Eurozone, you know, th these dates that are looming, are, are they going to affect the, um, the US system, the US financial system? And can the Europeans get themselves on track and get out of uh, the sort of the stalemate of uh, indecision? Um, do, you, do you want me to take that, sure. that in the Eurozone? Um, in terms of, you know, will it have an impact in the U.S.? Of course it will have an impact on the U.S. Um, Europe, um, Europe is the, the U.S.'s biggest trading partner. Um, I, 
uh, one of the, the bright spots uh, for the administration has actually been kind of exports, and so that, that's going to put uh, pressure, pressure on growth. Um, uh, are the Europeans going to sort, sort themselves out? I'm, I must admit, the more that I look into this, um, the more I don't think it's going to happen. And the revealed preference of the European leaders is to talk tough and to act weak. So they say, we will do whatever it takes to support the, Euro the, the Eurozone. Um, and instead of kind of presenting a, boost, a bazooka to blast their way through the problem, they have a pea shooter instead. You know, the EFSF um, funding that they came together in July on, they funded that in terms of 400, 400 billion euros. You know, most, most market participants think that's, that's pretty good in terms of dealing with kind of Greece, dealing with Ireland and Portugal. It is completely ineffective in terms of dealing with Spain and Italy. And, you know, goodness knows if France kind of gets played into the crisis. Most market sentiment is, is basically what the Europeans need is a fund of between, uh, you could call it a kind of tarp fund of, you know, one trillion to two trillion. The problem that you've got is how do you sell that to the German public, who fundamentally believe that this is a crisis not of their making, um, and then it's the cause of, you know, uh, Greek complacency. And the, the failure inside German politics has not been to explain, A, how Germany benefits from the euro and, and if the euro were to break up the cost of the German public. Secondly, not to be able to break out Greece from Spain and Ireland. Greece is a real problem um, in, in terms of it's insolvent. Um, and, you know, the problem, the cause of the financial crisis in Ireland and Spain is completely different. That is about kind of asset bubbles. It's much more equivalent to the US, which is basically interest rates for Spain and Ireland were too low which led to kind of, you know, basically asset speculation, which then kind of went bang. So the, the cause of the financial crisis there is completely different um, to Greece. However, the Germans have basically lumped it all together, and that has kind of created, you know, considerable problems in selling it to their publics about why big action should be taken. And as a result, I think you're going to see around the margins some improvement um, and some tough words on October the 23rd that will get them kind of through it into the G20, and then the G20, I, I just don't see what they're going to produce over and above what they've already got. And I think at that point, there's a very good chance of a market correction in November. Richard, you're advising Greece. Is there anything you can offer to us in terms of the views of the... Well, I mean, I, look, I think there are a number of things that I'd like to offer to disentangle some of the Greek story, because I think Greece has been uh, a prime example of the way that headline risk works in markets. Uh, I'm constantly stunned at the utter shallowness of most market commentators' understanding of the Greek economy uh, or what's going on uh, uh, domestically in terms of politics. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, Greeks don't pay taxes. In fact, the, uh, the share of GDP collected in taxes in Greece is higher than it is in the United States. The Greeks pay a heavy load of taxation, but they do it primarily through social security deductions from payrolls and also from the payment of excise and VAT taxes, and that plus a smaller uh, collection of income and, uh, on corporate and personal uh, income uh, means that they're collecting about 36, 37 percent of GDP in taxes. That doesn't sound to me like a country that doesn't pay taxes. So right from the start, the story is more complicated and not what it seems to be. Let me give you another example. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister sent me a, a, a copy of an article that had just appeared in the Wall Street jur Journal on a blogger page online that said that the CIA was reporting that there was a high likelihood of a military coup in Greece. And the Prime Minister was asking me, could you call the journal and find out where this has come from? Because we have no idea what they're talking about, uh, and our ambassador is calling the CIA, but they won't respond to a call from the Greek ambassador. Well, with a little help from my uh, highly qualified Kennedy School researcher, it took us about 20 minutes to discover that the Wall Street Journal blogger had picked up the story from another business blog that had done no original reporting, which in turn had picked it up from a Turkish newspaper, and you can just imagine, uh, which in turn had done no original reporting, which had picked it up from a story in Bild, the right-wing German tabloid that had published it four months earlier without a single quotation <coughs> or uh, reference to any extant CIA study of any kind. And I did get through to Langley and found out that the CIA was, and of course it would, but the CIA was absolutely denying 
that they had ever written any such report. And I, in this case, happened to believe them. And what I'm trying to point out is that there's been a terrible failure in terms of the quality of press coverage and a tendency to report rumor that doesn't meet the very simplest tests of second sourcing that should be a criterion for decent journalism, and it infects good papers as well as bad in this environment. Let me say something else in terms of data. I was talking with Poole Thompson, who's the head of the IMF team in Greece right now, a week ago today. Greece is going to next year actually run a primary surplus, meaning that going forward, the problem in Greece is not an abstract insolvency, but how to service its debt, the accumulated debt that was primarily, overwhelmingly accumulated before this government came in to office. It's the servicing of that debt that is a severe problem for the Greeks in order to return to anything like a growth path. In fact, the debt servicing now exceeds the sum total of all civil service wages in Greece. So you can just imagine the politics of going to the public sector, which means teachers and firemen and policemen as well as hated bureaucrats and saying to them, we've knocked your wages down 10%, we've cut your pensions by 15%, we're going to lay off another 75 to 100,000 of you this year, and we want to take more so that we can service the debt. Sounds like we may have an Occupy the Acropolis or something. But well, I think- Without what, joking about that too right. much, I want to make sure we turn it over for some questions. And so I want, I'm going to let, I'm, no, I'm going to ask, sure. okay, you can ask a question, and I want John to say something about the, but go ahead, ask. I, I just wonder what you think is going to happen. You know, how will this unfold? I think Brussels this weekend is very, very important because the problem, I, I, from the start, I mean, my, my, my view has been these governments are perfectly capable of throwing a pan-European blanket, in essence, a no cash up front line of credit that says uh, for the next five years or for the next X years, we commit as the governments of the Euro 17 to provide a backstop for our banks and for our sovereign debt, uh, meaning that we will meet any shortfall, shortfalls that occur in either of the two sectors. Putting that blanket up would forestall a lot of speculation and would stop a lot of the turmoil that's in the markets that's built on this feverish idea that failure is imminent. Uh, too much of what we've gotten ourselves into is imagining that every plane we get on is going to crash. Uh, and that's, uh, it's not the case. The Greek problem right now is that they're running a, 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 a servicing cost that's way too high for a country of its size. If you can calm the markets down, deal with the debt crisis in Greece, deal with the debt crisis in Portugal, which actually is being dealt with much better than the one in Greece, and work your way through the Irish problem, which is essentially a failure of property markets that's then been put onto the back of governments, <coughs> uh, I think that you've got a very good chance that you're going to get past the problem in Spain and get past the problem in Italy. There are problems. Part of it has to do in Italy with the instability of the government. I mean, Berlusconi just survived another near So crash. am I taking it you're actually optimistic that you think that they are going to... I'm guardedly optimistic because I know some of the terms that are under discussion right now for the Brussels discussions. My, my concern in the case of Greece is that there's a need, there's a need for a package that addresses not just the bond debt problem in private hands, but also addresses bank recapitalization and also front-loading the value of the privatized assets that they're being asked to sell off so you don't and, recreate a Russian situation. So, John, do you th think that <clears throat> if they fail like David suggested that they do and they don't do anything in Europe, it will bleed over to the U.S. and have an impact on the U.S. banks and it will have to be looking at a recapitalization or some sort of additional assistance into the largest U.S. banks? Well, I, I think there are two things. I mean, I totally agree with David. There's two ways it can come back to us. One is just as an economic matter. They are our biggest trading partner. Exports have been a big part of whatever growth we've had. You can impede that, and they can, their recession can drag us into a recession. But the stuff that I worry about and been more directly involved is, can the financial problem of them not taking care of what's going on with their banks turn into a crisis of confidence? that then comes back to the United States. And that is also very real. And it's not because US banks own a lot of Greek debt or European debt, they really don't, but they're exposed to all of their financial institutions. And if they start sneezing, we'll catch a cold. And so we have to be in a position 
they have to be in a position, you have to have, at the end of the day, strong banks to fund economic growth, one way or another, and they've got to get to that place. So if they did nothing and they had real crisis of confidence among their banks, it would come back to us. Well, maybe you, my last question, and then we're gonna turn it over to you all for questions, but is if we don't have confidence in the ability of the uh, EU to address this, that we don't have confidence and it blows over into the US, doesn't it really go to the fundamental that Without confidence, we don't have trust, and that people don't trust our banks right now. Glo I mean, they don't trust well, banks globally. I don't think globally. we're there yet. Let me, let me be clear. I don't think we're in that position. But, but yet. I, That's the danger, Diane. But I mean, I think, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's like when, when Winston Churchill always said about the U.S. government is that they always did the right thing after exhausting every other alternative repeatedly. <laughs> and you, you know, this is a very, and David knows way more about this than I do. We have our own very moments of extremely dysfunctional government. It's even worse in Europe, but you have to believe they are willing to take aggressive steps at times. They did during the crisis of 2008. And I guess I'm still hopeful that they will find their way to a place where they can do some things to stave this from happening. Did you have something to say, Barb? No. Anybody else want to? No, okay, we, right. we will turn it over to you all to ask uh, your questions. Um, now we're following form, form rules. Please identify yourself. Remember, you must ask a question. It needs to end in a question mark. And, um, and, and we're, we're looking to engage in a dialogue. So um, we will turn and to our first question. Uh, hi, uh, Jed Schwartz. Um, uh, the question is to uh, Mr. P uh, Dr. Parker. Uh, first question is, uh, of the 37% tax rate in Greece, how much of that is regressive and uh, levied on the uh, lower income quintiles and and would you wouldn't would you give given the idea that part of this problem is caused by a lack of consumer demand capacity would you endorse the idea of raising the upper the the, the top marginal tax brackets in Greece and and in the United States to to uh, to to uh, to uh, redistribute through and stimulate the economy? Uh, of course they're regressive, uh, particularly a flat VAT tax is by its nature a regressive. A flat sales tax is regressive. Um, and uh, not only do I endorse trying to uh, have uh, better collection, which is actually, it's not the rate structure, it's the collection ability uh, under the rate structure. My contribution was something some of you may have seen in the papers, which is suggesting that the Greek government use Google Earth to identify swimming pools in the backyards of, uh, of affluent Greek homes because you can essentially adjust the pool, the, the property tax, knowing that in fact uh, 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 th there are pools in the backyard uh, and that suggests higher property value. The other thing I suggested was something that the Brazilians uh, tried, which is, uh, what you do instead of waiting for an inspector to come around and, and value your property is uh, you are required each year to declare the value of your property, uh, which you might think would lead to, to, pro uh, to problems in underreporting, but it's with the proviso that for the 12 months afterward, the government has the right to buy your property for 10% more than the value you've declared. And Brazil's collecting a lot more property taxes at a fairly high efficiency rate in terms of uh, of uh, government costs by doing that. But, uh, so I'm working on that as well, too. Uh, you know, one of the things I find, and I'm working closely with the, the, tro the so-called Troika and the IMF team, is that in these extraordinarily detailed uh, analyses that the IMF does, uh, the one thing that is never there is uh, income and wealth distribution. Uh, and it's uh, one of the most interesting problems uh, in terms of trying to use international uh, agencies like the IMF uh, to oversee these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of restructurings, because in fact you're right. I mean the burden is asymmetrically borne uh, by middle working and lower classes right now. The poverty rate is rising dramatically. One of the most poignant things for me personally now is that uh, I stay in sort of middle class hotels and slightly less than middle class areas when I go to Athens and. It means often that when I get a couple hours off on a Sunday afternoon, I go out for a walk, and there are streets now that are lined on both sides with addicts, so much so that they're shooting up heroin without any concern for people walking by them, and in fact, putting their needles up behind their ears as if they were pencils to walk up and down the street. That's the sign of a society in deep pain, and it, it pains me deeply to see a society as wonderful as Greece going through that. 
Hi, my name is Matt Mason. I'm a graduate student here at Kennedy. And my question is for the panel, whoever wants to, uh, to take it. Um, <clears throat> last September, September 21st, the Fed uh, issued Operation Twist, um, buying, buying uh, long-term uh, bonds and, uh, and uh, selling short-term. Uh, the idea, obviously, to bend the yield curve. Uh, what, uh, you know, this, I think it was tried once in the 60s, but what impact do you see that having on either the world economy or the domestic economy as well? And then is there any kind of like side effect? I mean, there's talk about, you know, potential inflation, but are there any other kind of long-term side effects? Because I don't believe this has been done before, and if it has, you know, I'm not really sure what the effect was. Uh, well, Operation Twist was tried under the Kennedy administration, and uh, in fact, as John Kenneth Galbraith's biographer, I looked at it quite closely <coughs> because he uh, engaged in a long-running argument with both Treasury um, and also the CEA about it and said that it wouldn't work, and it didn't. And uh, my confidence in uh, trying to do the same thing right now is fairly low because you're in such a low, rate inter uh, low interest rate environment that the degree of twist that you can get uh, is not all that significant. Uh, and ultimately, the issues right now are not about interest rates in terms of investment and consumer demand. Uh, it's something more fundamental about confidence that when you live in these kinds of interest rates environments aren't going to be affected by basis points that are moving in the 10s, 20s, and 30s, or 40s, so. But I do think <clears throat> that the intent of this particular action is to try to bring down long-term interest rates, and particularly to try to bring rates down for home mortgage buyers. I think <clears throat> there is a very large notion, while they're low, this has made them somewhat lower. People don't have great expectations of what the impact could be, but I think they're going back to something Richard said earlier, the number of underwater borrowers, people whose mortgages are worth more than their homes, when they're in that position, they are paying a current mortgage at a relatively high interest rate. And because of the way mortgage refinance rules work with lenders, it's very difficult to refinance that mortgage into a lower interest rate. I think there are many people who think it would be a quite good thing for the US economy if these people who are paying their mortgages regularly but can't refinance into something right. lower, if they're able to refinance into a lower paying mortgage, that's more money to spend. It would help the economy. And Operation Twist doesn't help them get that mortgage, but it lowers and put, would put more money in their pockets. Separately, there's a lot of talk and a lot of effort being spent now in a number of different quarters to see if there is a way to have this broad-based refinancing program go on that could be quite helpful. It's not, it's not going to be a panacea, but it could help the situation. And by the way, we know that Operation Twist was tried before because it was named after the dance, the twist, which was prevalent in the Kennedy administration. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to add one quick thing, which is the Fed is really cognizant of its role in the economy, and, and it just wants to keep trying something to make people think that they can, they got more tools in their pockets and they're going to it's be called able to op, help. The next one is called Operation Push the String. Yeah, so we'll exactly. I, but I mean, I, I think you have to at least give the Fed credit for being pretty creative and always trying something new. And um, paying, paying you to borrow money. Is when other step. people aren't able to do it. You know, I mean, the rest of the government is kind of paralyzed. Um, so I think that's, I think part of the Fed's thinking is we want to give the market some confidence by doing something. And I think we have to keep in mind we have a chairman who did his, the chairman of the Fed, who did his doctoral thesis and all his study on the Great Depression. And he's doing everything he can to ensure this economy does not go back into a depression. Don't make, the same don't, don't make the same mistakes that will lead to a depression. I want to turn to um, another question. Hi, I'm Rachel Brown. I'm with the economist Lyndon LaRouche, and I'm a candidate for Congress against Barney Frank. And my, my question uh, is that possibly this uh, financial crisis isn't solvable because it's not really a financial crisis. It's not a banking crisis. And what we're finding is that the bailouts aren't working. The okay. EF. You the, need to ask a question. It, with that it will definitely be a question. Um, but the, the, the EFS. Have, but this evening. <laughs> EFSF, you know, just, just got completed. <clears throat> and they're now trying to leverage it four times, ten times, however many times they possibly can to get more credit to flow into the, into the system. And what is it going to? It's not the, the national debt. It's, it's these speculative interests, these speculative assets, the toxic assets. They're still there. They're still there from 2007. So that, that is why we're still here discussing it today. Um, so the, there's a growing call for Glass-Steagall, such as by the former uh, French Prime Minister, Michel Rocard. Uh, Schäuble just said maybe we should bring this into discussion. 
And the idea is not just simply to say, well, you know, it was a separation of banking, but that essentially reenacting Glass Steagall would allow all these toxic assets. So are you asking we should re implement Glass Steagall? Re implement Glass Steagall, yes, and also geared towards the Pacific because you're also seeing the transatlantic sector collapsing and you're seeing a different policy. Well, I think we could talk a whole session Russia on Glass Steagall. So why don't we go with um, should we reinstate Glass Steagall? So would that solve the crisis? So back to your original rule here, Glass Steagall was something that separated investment banking from commercial banking <laughs> in the 1930s. That's thought to be one way to address the problems that make sure to, to try to prevent a recurrence of the depression. There's a lot of debate whether that was the right policy response. But in what's happened today, there's been a lot of people said, should we reinstate this separation between commercial banking and investment banking, redo the Glass-Steagall Act? My personal answer is no. I don't think this had anything to do with the crisis. And in fact, I would argue that more, uh, the more fundamental thing that led to the crisis in terms of market structure was that we regulated commercial banks much more intensively and we didn't regulate the investment banking and trading houses. One thing Dodd-Frank, I think, did get right is that any com com company that through their trading activities or any activities that becomes so significant to the system that it can cause the United States government to put $180 billion into one com company, we can't have that happen. We need to bring them all under the same regulatory tent. So I don't think, going back to a world pretending that you can regulate part and not regulate another part is the right answer. But just to clarify, the $180 billion went to AIG, which was an insurance company, which never would have been covered by Glass-Steagall anyway. Well, but it was in a very significant financial products in the trading area that people have talked about. So my point right. really is now that, number two, if we, hadn't, if we had had Glass-Steagall in place, we couldn't have done some of the rescue actions that we did that allowed some of the commercial banks to buy some of those, and like Bear Stearns, and it would cost much more to the federal government. So I, don't th I think the answer is to put them in the same tent and regulate them better than it is to pretend that you can separate them. Um, in, in, the case of the, in the case of the UK, there's a big discussion taking place about something that's kind of akin to Glass-Steagall um, at the moment. Personally, I think that's, again, it's about the design of the, the, design of the safety belts, not dealing with the styling of the car. Um, but, and the other thing in the UK, the first sign of the financial crisis was the failure of a bank called Northern Rock. Northern Rock didn't have an investment banking arm. Um, Northern Rock was just using the wholesale funding markets in order to, um, uh, in, in order to run its kind of mortgage book. So that was a small bank with no, with no investment arm, and it, you know, without government intervention, it would have gone, it would have gone bankrupt. Um, uh, so again, it shows you that you can have too much focus in terms of the regulatory structure, you've got to deal with some of the underlying issues um, as a result. Comments either about glass oh, Good, but there's other people who have questions and I don't have anything great to say. Hi, my name is Ellie Pridinoff. <coughs> I am actually a graduate of Miami University and a local student. Um, my question for the panel is, um, it has to do with Harry Markopoulos, the whistleblower in the Madoff Ponzi scheme. Um, he had showed that hundreds of major banks were aware of the fraud as early as 2000, and he took the information to the SEC and the Wall Street Journal, and they, neither of them acted on the information. And also, Brooksley Bourne is another example of someone at the CFTC who was uh, for the regulation of derivatives. So the question is, when you have such obvious information that, wrongdoing is, that wrongdoing is happening, and nothing is done about it. Um, like what, what can really be done when there's su such a massive, um, there's, a, there's such a massive enforcement uh, on regulation? There's a, uh, sorry. I'm, well, I think there were certainly some regulatory yeah. failures, but I'll yeah. you know, turn it to Barb. Yeah, I mean, there was. I mean, I, I said that earlier. And Dodd-Frank tried to fix that by basically you know, reading the Riot Act to the regulators and giving them a whole lot more power. I mean, I don't think the SEC is ever gonna make that mistake again. You know, um, but I, I agree with you. I mean, there's, I, it wasn't exactly a question, but I do agree with you. Um, and Dodd-Frank tried to fix it, but you know, people are human and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff with the whole Madoff SEC thing. I mean, somebody's daughter-in-law or sister-in-law, I can't even remember, but I mean, there, it's, it's worse than it even seems. Um, it wasn't like they just ignored it. I think the people that investigated it had some kind of uh, interest in it. Um, and that's just, it happens. 
I mean, the government is not perfect. <laughs> Alex. Hi, uh, my name is Alex. I'm a junior at the college, and I'm a student liaison for uh, Diane's study group here at the IOP. Um, and my question is directed to Mr. Richard Parker. Um, you centered a lot of your comments on Greece's servicing cost, and I was curious if you'd kind of give us a high-level overview of the stages of its restructuring thus far, and whether or not you see the next step in managing its servicing costs as additional restructuring or outright default. Well, to date, there hasn't been significant restructuring of the debt that they're carrying in the private sector. Is that what you're asking about, the, the, the so-called GGBs and the, that are held by your, mainly European banks and insurance companies? Yes. Uh, I don't want to get too technical about it. What happened on July 21st was that the heads of state thought in Brussels they'd worked out a package that consisted of this 440 billion euro funding of EFSF plus what's called the PSI deal, which was meant to administer uh, roughly a 21% haircut on the bonds that were being held, and then to take those bonds, roll them over into a new set of bonds. The new set of bonds would be long maturity, pretty low interest rates, and would also have a grace period in terms of repayment built into them. That deal has not been completed, and I'm not talking out of school to say that that deal has fallen by the wayside in the minds of the principals in Europe as they work their way toward the Brussels meeting this weekend. The talk for the last several weeks has been about a more significant so-called haircut. The number 50% has been in play. Uh, one thing to be aware of, and this is maybe too esoteric uh, for some of you, but is of importance, which is the talk so far is focused on 50% reduction of the privately held Greek government debt. Uh, the problem is that so much now is held by uh, uh, official agencies, the, the ECB, uh, the so-called Troika, uh, or is held by Greek banks uh, and Greek pension funds that uh, administering a haircut would not significantly lower the level of Greek debt to, to GDP ratio, it would take it down by from 165 to 145, which is not going to please them. The markets on Monday are not going to go, whoopee, everything is solved. The Greek GDP to, that debt to GDP ratio is now 145%. That's not going to be a big story. Um, but the secondary problem with a haircut of any size is that because Greek banks hold 40 billion worth of those, uh, 40 billion euros worth of those bonds, you will bankrupt. You will, you will turn a fiscal crisis into a financial sector crisis that will level the Greek financial sector if there is not a separate but connected recapitalization program ready to go. And there are a lot of details to be worked out about such a plan, so. David, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean I, I mean, I completely agree, and I think it's been one of the underreported things about what the, what the haircut could actually mean to the Greek, bank, Greek banking sector. Um, but again, um, I, I mean, I would say here that the, I mean, the markets aren't really concerned about Greece. Let's be absolutely clear about this. They kind of think, you know, there's got to be a haircut of some form or another. You know, um, it needs to be dealt with. What their focus is on, which is, do we believe what Merkel and Sarkozy say, that they're prepared to defend the euro, whatever the cost. The, Greece is gone. Their focus is now kind of Spain and Italy, and perhaps France. And you know, that, is, that is where the, the, the market's kind of focus it, is on. And I think that's why you know, people here should be very, very frightened. Because this is no longer about you know, one country that looks, that looks to be insolvent. This is about watching the infection go up through the vein and into the internal organs. Um, because as soon as you start to play in really large economies like Italy, uh, like <clears throat> Spain, and potentially France, then that, that is really kind of market, market moving as a result. And that's what the markets are kind of focused in on, which is Greece is Greece. What are you going to do in order to protect Italy and Spain? And do you have the fire, firepower to do it? Let me, can I just say one thing about that? I think it's important to distinguish between Greece doesn't matter anymore and an image that Paul Volcker used in a conversation that I had with him two weeks ago. He said Greece is like the front door of a burning building. The firemen have to go through that front door to fight the fire. So there's going to have to be some settlement of the Greek problem as part of this larger package. And I think it's important to help people keep that in mind. Diane Tate. Um, I work at the Australian Bankers Association, but I'm here studying for a bit. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of regulation and regulatory failure. Um, a few years back, my colleagues at the associations from Europe and America and, and Asia 
sitting around talking about those offshore hedge funds, those crazy, wacky offshore hedge funds, and I'd ponder, well, you know, are they really offshore? Are they floating around on boats or what? Like, you know, they've got to be somewhere. In Greenwich. <laughs> so my question is, what can we do about global regulation coordination? What's the role of the FSB or IOSCO? And how can we get uh, regulators to actually really cooperate? There was a concept a couple of years back about mutual recognition, Australia and the SEC. So ASIC and the SEC started a conversation. We had a financial crisis, it disrupted that. But I think that if they're really cooperating, that, that's about sharing information and that's gotta be better for global regulation. So let me start. Yeah. Um, so as, when I was controller, I sat on the Basel Committee, which was expanded to be, it's all the banking regulators from um, essentially now the G20 countries. And I also sat on the financial, what became the Financial Stability Board, which has not just banking regulators, but insurance regulators, treasuries, and ministries of finance, and central bankers. Um, <clears throat> And I would say during the crisis, there was cooperation. Um, David made this point earlier. There's nothing like a crucible of crisis to force people to do things where before they just couldn't reach agreements on things. And they did take a number of steps in a coordinated way. When we had the problems in 2008 in the United States, governments around the world during that October weekend went out and guaranteed the balance sheets of their banks as they issued debt and it all was a very effective coordinated thing that happened. I think there has been a step up in efforts to do coordinated regulation, but as I mentioned earlier, it's very uneven. I think the trend is to do more rather than less. I was surprised, frankly, in my role as controller how much time I spent on international issues and got to know regulators from other countries. I think that has been the trend for the last 20 years, again, with very uneven results. And, you know, I think some people despair, but I actually think that more of this can go on in a constructive way than most people think. I think we're gonna get there over time. I think there's gonna be a lot of domestic solutions first, and then eventually, you know, I think as we muddle through and get to the other side of this, there will be, I think there will be a lesson learned. I mean, maybe that's a little Pollyanna, but I, I think that there is a, Right now, it's a protector backyard at the expense of the neighborhood mentality, a little bit. I'm not disagreeing with you, John. I do think there's more coordination than there had been, but I think there's gonna be, eventually there's gonna be more because at some point, we're gonna have to be able to resolve a failed institution that's operating in more than one country. And you know, we're gonna have to, they call it cross-border resolution. And we're gonna have to get to that point where we have I don't know, international agreements where, on how we're gonna take down a big company. Because we're really just getting good at this whole taking down com companies. I mean, that's one of the things we've learned how to do. Um, <laughs> uh, but I do. I think over time it's going to get better because it has to. Well, I guess we don't really want to experience Lehman again. No. No. So we, can we agree on that? David, what, about, what do you think? I, mean, I, th I think there's a big, I think there's a big role to play for an expanded IMF in terms of its role in remit. Um, uh, and for the IMF t uh, to become engaged as a, as a much better early warning mechanism um, in, in, the, in the global financial system. And I think as part and parcel of that, of that kind of uh, reformed and revised IMF, I think you need to accept a much bigger role um, uh, from, from key countries like China. Um, uh, you know, you look at kind of Chinese, Chinese attitudes to how the, you know, how the Eurozone crisis is, is being handled, and they're ex you know, extremely concerned about it. And, um, and they're right to be concerned about it because it could have a big impact on their leadership transition next year. Um, so I do think there is, a, there is a big role for institutions like the IMF to kind of go, go further and have an expanded role in remit. Well, I think what I'm going to do is just say, I'll start this time, I'll start with you, Richard, and just say, you know, we've talked a lot about the financial crisis. I don't see any other questions out there. So I think what I'm going to do is just allow our panelists to kind of pull it to um, a little bit of a close and, and say, this is sort of dire. I mean, it's not real uplifting. Um, so are we going to be able to uh, bring about a world where we can live without financial crises and, and live uh, in a way where we can um, have resolutions that are effective um, cross-border and, uh, and have a world where we uh, can actually have a safe and sound financial system? So starting. We can certainly have a safer and a sounder financial system, both domestically and globally. That's not uh, a Pollyannish dream at all. Uh, but it does require a revisiting of fundamental 
both ideological and academic assumptions about the relative weighting of government and uh, firm power. I hesitate to use the word market. I think I want to just concentrate on the role of firms because markets are ancient and we're, we're facing a particular world in which the six largest banks in America have assets equal to two-thirds of the U.S. economy. So I think we need to talk about firms rather than markets <coughs> themselves. Um, you know, there are uh, a number of coordinated efforts that are going on across borders already, uh, uh, striking out at, corru uh, uh, at uh, corruption and in particular tax evasion by squeezing the Swiss and the Liechtensteinians and others is a very interesting thing that I wouldn't have thought the Europeans capable of 15 or 20 years ago. And so maybe there's some hope there that just that one piece of it can move. Uh, it's also the case that the incredible speed with which so many of these transactions move across borders means that it's on an, uh, uh, computer systems that themselves can be used to track malfeasance of all sorts. If you'll remember, at a certain point a few years ago, the CIA tapped into the SWIFT system, which is the, one, of the clearing, one of the big clearing systems, uh, and uh, immediately then had to insist that it was only looking for terrorist activity, not illegal, uh, mere, merely illegal financial transactions. Uh, but should there be a political push that required government to go after that kind of malfeasance from, uh, from voters, uh, the technology is actually there to use to, uh, to track it down rather readily. As, uh, someone said if the, if the government was really deeply committed in Greece to rooting out fraud and tax evasion, the, the uh, Central Bank of Greece knows where all of those transactions went, and that just simply happens to be the case in terms of transfers outside of the country. Barb, do you have I just think that the uh, U.S. financial system is definitely safer today than it was three years ago. They have put, what, 300 billion more capital into the system. It's, uh, they don't appear to be chastened. I mean, the CEOs of large banks, but I think they are. Um, I think internally they're taking fewer risks. Um, I think because of a lot of the parts of Dodd-Frank that are too specific to get into, they're going to become more streamlined and maybe even smaller. Um, I, I think. I actually think the U.S. financial system is kind of heading in the right direction. Um, and I, I, even though you have so much more experience and knowledge than I have on this topic, I really think that the EU politicians are going to pull it together because they don't really have an alternative. Um, I mean, if, if they don't, I'm taking all my money <laughs> and putting it in my mattress, you know, before next week. It, I mean, they just kind of have to. And I think politicians, no matter how bad the choices are, um, when push comes to shove and they know they have to make it or it's going to be all hell breaks loose, they, they, make, they make maybe not a great choice, but they make a choice that allows them to move forward without the you know, bottom falling out. Um, I'll kind of comment on that. I mean, I, I think the kind of hope strategy is kind of misplaced. I mean, I hope to be taller and better looking. It's not going to happen. Um, uh, and the revealed preference of the European leaders is that they are not going to deal with this because it is so politically unpalatable in Germany. Um, you can, it's very difficult to go back and ask for, for more money when seven out of 10 Germans are absolutely opposed on it. And the key fear for Merkel is about feeding extremes in, in her country. Um, and that is a big political reality in Germany and it's a, it's a, driver, of the, it's a driver of this crisis. Um, going back to, you know, so that's kind of pretty gloomy. But what about kind of longer term, I kind of go back to, to, to the way that I started, which is the cause of the crisis in 2008 was, um, and we have seen kind of increased incidence of financial crises since the 1970s, um, uh, more frequently than in the, the previous round of globalization in the 1800s. Um, and the reason for that is twofold, which is one, there was clearly ineffective regulation, there was too much ineffective domestic regulation, not good enough um, uh, global regulation. There has been some improvement on global regulation. There's more that can be done. It's a safety belt. The key issue, uh, the second part of the cause of the crisis was global imbalances. We still fundamentally have not dealt with that. So therefore, we are more likely to, you know, to see the impact of that, the, the drive for yield. There's a massive drive for yield going on at the moment. It's causing huge problems for the Chinese leaders. Um, you've got underground banking, you've got speculation on cabbage prices because there is a desperate search for yield amongst, amongst ordinary Chinese middle class people who want to save more when in actual fact they should be kind of spending more and you know that, that would help the global, global economy. 
those fundamental big imbalances still remain while there has been improvement on regulation and therefore you're still more likely, I think, to see um, financial crises as a result. Well, I uh, totally agree with Barb that the U.S. financial system is in a stronger position now than it was three years ago. But there are two things that I think are really huge challenges. One is when you have a recession or an economic problem called, caused by a financial crisis, it tends to be more severe, it's harder to work through, it has an overhang. And the fact of the matter is we made, because of the easy credit that was involved, a lot of people got loans that they just couldn't pay back and it's gonna take a long time to work through that and we see that in the, the absolute horrendous overhang of the mortgage problem that will be with us for several more years and we're gonna have to grind through it. But I think we are moving in the right direction, we just have to keep grinding through it, it's gonna be slow. The other big challenge is Europe, and we, as we talked about it, I hope Barbara's right. I worry Dave is wrong. This is the continent that brought us World War I when people made some really bad decisions, when it looked like there were many different options that could have ended up with a different result that didn't result in the slaughter of tens of millions of people. And so, I, you know, I worry about the trend of dysfunctionality in politics in the United States and in Europe. I am hopeful that they will do the right thing in the end, but you know, it's, it's only a hope. Well, I think there's one key takeaway, and that is that the financial system is a global system on the large end, and that we need to be looking at it on an integrated basis. And I think we've started that path with our regulators. Um, I like to think that we could take the optimistic views and, 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 and keep our fingers all crossed that the Europeans get it right, and they go through the front door for uh, Richards, uh, and, it's right with Greece. But I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. And um, um, hopefully, you, you've answered all your financial questions. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.